So I am going to promise you a practical approach to treatment-resistant depression, but honestly, I could just end with where the patient ended about maintaining hope and the importance of our having optimism and holding that for our patients when they're not able to have it themselves. I think that is one of the themes and one of the most important parts of our ongoing treatment of patients with really challenging to treat depression. So I'm gonna do a definition of treatment-resistant depression. I'll talk a little bit about what we know of the epidemiology, talk about what comprehensive treatment should look like, and then treatment options for those with more challenging to treat depression. So I was inspired to do this round by a recent consult that Dr. Megan Hussein and I did in the Affective Consult Clinic, where a patient came in with this consult question, do I have treatment-resistant depression? Now, Dr. Hussein's beautiful note outlines all of his med trials. There are a couple of themes. One, there is only one adequate trial among all of these. And at the end, you see the pattern we see sometimes with 15-minute rather than 60-minute appointments, where every visit there was a different medication, none ever titrated. And when we ask him, you were doing well on 40 of Prozac, why did you go to 20? He's like, I don't remember, except I don't like being on medicine. So again, all those conversations to facilitate optimal care are really challenging to do in a primary care setting or in a setting where you have such limited time with the patient. So here are the three terms that get used commonly. One is treatment-resistant depression, and that's what I'll use because it is what's most commonly used, although it's problematic. It almost feels like we're telling the patients that they're resistant to treatment, which is not our goal ever, and it's our treatments recommended that aren't working typically, although, you know, it involves everyone. Partially responsive treatment, which is important when you're thinking about next steps, should I switch, should I augment, and then a new term that I think is probably better, difficult to treat depression, because it doesn't have this implication that somehow the patient is being resistant to getting better. I don't think I've ever met anyone that didn't want to get better from their depression. It's incredibly painful and torturous. So a group of over 60 experts were convened to come up with consensus definitions, and this was using the Delphi method where they said, if we're gonna do randomized trials, we need to have a definition we all agree upon. And in the Delphi method, they also report on what percent of people agreed. So 96% agreed that treatment-resistant depression was a minimum of two failed treatments where there was less than 25% improvement with adequate dosing and duration. And then within their discussion, they decided that adequate dosage and duration meant a minimal approved dosage for at least four weeks. And they had 74% agreement there. I would have been in the 26, because that is essentially saying that 10 milligrams of escitalopram would be an adequate dose. And I think we know that is a very common problem. Now again, because these are for randomized controlled trials, the definition of partially responsive depression is also important because you might include those patients, say, in a next step trial. And that was having an improvement that's between 25 and 50%, with 50% usually being at least response. So what I find more helpful is a way of thinking about this that, that uh, Michael Thais and John Rush proposed in 1997 where they were talking about the different stages of treatment-resistant depression. As you can see, these are patients we often take care of on the inpatient units or that we see in the consultation clinic where increasingly intensive treatments haven't been successful. There's a big difference between seeing a patient who has failed a single adequate trial of medication versus someone who's now had multiple trials or a tricyclic or an MOI or bilateral ECT. And recently, Massachusetts General also put forward a similar scheme where each failed trial was a point, each augmentation strategy a half point, ECT three points. So the idea that there's a difference between I haven't done well on two treatments versus seven. And I think we know that when we're having to have reasonable optimism, always optimism, but tempered optimism as someone has had seven adequate trials versus none or one. 
So when we are thinking about treatment-resistant depression, we obviously would like to predict it. And this is something when we think about the work in the precision centers of let's look at this heterogeneous group and try to get subsets. If you look at the epidemiologic literature or the, the clinical literature trying to say what are factors that make you more likely to develop or have treatment-resistant depression in the future, the strongest and most consistent evidence is for having a comorbid anxiety disorder, suicidal thoughts, severe symptoms, and multiple previous episodes. And a lot of those make sense. Factors that have been less consistently found in this clinical literature would be the duration of the current episode, although that is, I think we know, the longer it's gone on, the, the more challenging it can be to treat. Having had psychotic symptoms, a very early age of onset, a number of previous hospitalizations, and someone's socioeconomic status. So having challenging depression that's more severe is harder to treat. I mean, that is not a revelation, but I think when we're thinking about our patients, we need to think about it because if those factors are there, we might more quickly go to a different intervention like, say, ECT, you know, when you're thinking about how are you going to manage this. So when we think how common is it, we usually turn to STAR-D. It was a large uh, study that was about uh, in the community of over 4,000 patients where they tried to capture what we do in practice. It was the sequence treatment alternatives to relieve depression where you say, we'll start with an SSRI. If that doesn't work, we'll either switch or augment or add psychotherapy. And then you go through this whole series of steps where you're getting increasingly, we hope, effective treatments. Although there's not really data to say that nortriptyline is better than other antidepressants. There's just the Johns Hopkins collective view that nortriptyline is better than other antidepressants. So you go through all of that, and what did they find? A couple things. One, at each successive step, another group of people went into remission. And that is where I think we can hold hope. And other older studies that were done at the NIH years ago showed that even at 10 years, people can get well. So it's not that people can't get well, but it's less likely. You're most likely if you're earlier in this process. And essentially, two-thirds of the patients achieve remission, and that roughly 30% not achieving remission, having a higher bar than just response, but remission, that's what's commonly found in, in the literature, about 30%. There's another epidemiologic study that I think shares important information. And that's the National Comorbidity Survey Replication. So this was of over 9,000 adults where they focused on depression, anxiety, and substance use for comorbidity. And part of that study was to ask about your treatment in the last 12 months. Now, they had an extremely low bar for minimally, and let's stress minimally adequate treatment. So it was a medication at any dose for two months, with four visits associated, or psychotherapy where you met with anyone eight times for at least a half an hour. So we'll agree this is such a low bar. But here are the sort of chilling results, that with that low bar, here are the results. We find that only 15% of those in primary care are getting this low, minimally adequate treatment, but in psychiatric settings, it's only a little more than 40%. And when I talked about this result recently in the PGY2 seminar, Dr. Pan pointed out and said, what's up with the 40% with the psychiatrists? And I'm going to talk about that. Why is it that we're not having better success, too? I think that 15-minute short visits contributes in both of these settings. And we often have a different standard that, that I think facilitates sometimes better outcomes. So why are people not getting minimally adequate care? Well, the first is no one's taking a history and formulating the case completely. I have not seen antidepressants work if someone is smoking pot three times a day. Right, when we have these comorbidities that aren't being addressed, that's problematic, and that's part of a comprehensive formulation. There are issues with adherence, or only partial adherence, and that's because no one in the world is prepared for a medicine that takes a while to work, that you have to take every day, and that it takes weeks and weeks. Young people starting treatment have mainly had pain medicine and antibiotics. 
that do not take weeks to work, and so they're not set up. And so if you don't have the adequate education, and I would say good psychotherapy, you're not going to keep someone engaged. So people drop out of care. You know, they start something that doesn't work, and they say, forget it. This isn't going to help me because they haven't really been prepared. So a lot of support, frequent visits, and really cheerleading that it's going to take more time and not to say, you're not feeling better, let's just switch to something else because that's a way to never help anyone. Sorry, the computer's having a moment. We also have limited availability of treatment. We've heard that from multiple colleagues here. We have an inadequate number of psychiatrists. We can be negative about the care provided in primary care, but we do not have enough psychiatrists to provide all the care. And so we have to help our colleagues uh, have better standards too. And people have limited resources to get medication, to go to psychotherapy visits, to go to frequent visits, because that is practical. So let's take each of these in turn. So what is the issue with diagnosis? Well, first we know that there's an incredibly broad differential for someone coming to say, I'm depressed or I'm feeling sad, or things are just off or my family's worried about me, of many different areas. So how do you accurately diagnose major depression? Well, the first thing is it's a purely clinical diagnosis. We have no blood tests. We have no brain scan. We have nothing. We don't have any biomarkers yet. Hopefully those are coming. So because it's a purely clinical diagnosis, you need someone to have insight. I think that many people I've seen explain to me their weakness and how they're not a good person and how they're just being lazy when they're depressed because that feels more accurate than you have a treatable medical illness that's not your fault. And then also, when you're doing this, you need a skilled assessment and information from an outside informant, and this is a theme for today, that all takes time that people often don't have. It's not unusual now in community practice for an initial assessment to be 30 minutes and follow-up visits to be 15. And I can stand here with control of my schedule and say, I really can't do an assessment in less than two hours, which we all know. I tried during COVID, but I'll admit I failed. It still took me two hours. But we also have colleagues, like the person we saw who's in a rural part of Virginia who has a commitment to seeing more patients. So again, it's a public health issue. There are people trying to see more patients, and so maybe they're trying to do it in a tighter time frame, and so there's a balance in all of this. So when we think about comprehensive treatment, we know that it needs to be multidisciplinary. As I will show you later, there's clear data that the combination of medication and psychotherapy is superior. And then other things need to happen, and that's if you formulate it properly, you're thinking about interrupting other behaviors, and a broad range of treatments. And the way we think about formulation, of course, was the perspectives. And so when we think about comprehensive treatment, we think of it as a perspectives-based approach. So we want to accurately diagnose an underlying condition, like major depression, and initiate treatment that makes sense for that diagnosis, and continue to reassess. I mean, especially in mood disorders, it could be that someone has depression for years and then there's an emergency of hypomanic or manic symptoms, which means you need to have a completely different treatment approach. For psychotherapy, everyone with a mood disorder benefits from psychotherapy. There's no doubt about it. Now, some people would say, what if someone has a very clear comorbid personality disorder when they definitely need psychotherapy? But their ability to manage a major depressive episode is perhaps less than someone else, and so that's why you want comprehensive treatment. But I'll also say that everyone in the midst of a major depressive episode is more vulnerable to their personality vulnerabilities. We're all, everyone who's depressed is the most challenging version of themselves, and so making sure you have comprehensive treatment is important. And then so important to interrupt the negative behaviors, our patient this morning talked about getting sober, now being sober for 20 years, and also getting a control of eating disorder behaviors. Without those under control, it's really unrealistic that treatment of the depression is going to be very effective. And then finally, this is all happening to a person, and we have to have that in context. So there are lots of different antidepressants. We have no consistent data to tell us where to start. John Mann, about 20 years ago, put forward this algorithm, which I think is still helpful with the ideas you start, 
If things aren't going well, you say, do we have the diagnosis right? Is the dosage right? But if that's all set, you say, all right, there's an inadequate response, and what should I do? Switch, augment, or combine are the three main strategies. Now here it says consider psychotherapy at any time. Obviously, there should be psychotherapy at all times. And then also consider ECT at any time. I want to underscore that. I think we put ECT too far down the list of treatment options. And there's very clear data that if you are doing ECT after there have been perhaps two or three treatments versus seven, there's a much better response rate. And so it should not be a treatment of last resort. So which should we do? Again, going back to the STAR-D, on level two, they had, you could as a patient have patient preference to say I want to switch or augment or add psychotherapy. The interesting thing is that once you were in the switch group or the augment group, you were randomized to three different treatments for switching or two treatments for augmentation. And the results were that they were pretty much all the same, which was surprising. It was most surprising to me that bupropion and buspirone were the same, because I wouldn't have predicted that, to be honest with you. But, and that might just be more time with the primary antidepressant, who knows. But this doesn't help us, because they were similar remission rates. And so yes, doing something else is good, but which thing to do next, we don't really have data to say one is better than the other. Now I'm going to tell you about a fascinating study that was done in Stockholm. There's the Stockholm Major Depression Cohort collected between 2010 and 2017 where it's Sweden, they have a registry, they have all the information. So they have information on over 158,000 depressive episodes. And among those, they identified uh, essentially 13,000 treatment-resistant episodes, and treatment resistance was defined when you started your third antidepressant. Now, this very colorful slide shows the flow. 60% started on an SSRI, and then you see where they went next, and you see, can see that with the darkest bars. So they went to all the different treatment options and then they flowed back to others. A tiny percent had three SSRI treatments, probably not what we would necessarily want. Other than showing that you try something and then people go to all different next steps, that's the main point I want to make. I also want to make the point that even in Sweden, with National Health, where they're very guideline-driven, they're also not using nortriptyline. Nortriptyline is that little tiny red bar which I find sad. So if you're going to augment, and I put combine in with augment because it's combining medicines, here are the big categories that we know you might do. You might combine two antidepressants. In a national survey of psychiatrists, they found that combining SSRI and bupropion was the most common next step, and that is obviously because of side effects, but also they have, comp we think, complementary action, and so that makes sense to combine them. A combination I think we use a lot is to add a tricyclic to an SSRI. And then the other augmentation strategies that we know, lithium, second generation neuroleptics, thyroid, other mood stabilizers like lamotrigine, and then stimulant. In a recent network meta-analysis, they looked at all these different augmentation strategies. Now in this wild graphic, the width of the bars is how many studies there are. And so you can see lithium and aripiprazole are the two boldest lines. And mainly these are comparing from the little point of placebo. So it's placebo versus. And that's what they mainly are. And you can see there's a large number of medications that are helpful that either cause response or remission, thyroid, lithium, multiple second generation antipsychotics. So we have lots of different options, but again, there aren't the head-to-head -head comparisons to say one's better than another. Now in Canada, the Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatments, CANMAT, has put out incredibly useful guidelines. These are from 2016, and they have level one treatments, which are aripiprazole, quetiapine, and risperidone. I do think that those are very well done studies. They have randomized control trials. I just want to underscore that Level one recommendations can only come from a randomized controlled trial, and older medications like lithium really just don't have those. And so we have to use some clinical judgment too. 
But where are we with these different medicines that we use for treatment? Well, we have no winners in that they all could be helpful, but we still don't know what's best for the patient in front of you, which is incredibly challenging. We don't have data to drive what our next step is. Psychotherapy is usually underutilized, and in studies, it's almost always something like CBT, not perhaps looking at DBT, or, or the more complex kind of psychotherapy you do with someone who's severely depressed versus getting better. And the comorbid behaviors are rarely addressed. What was different about the STAR-D study is that you were actually allowed to be in the study if you had comorbid behaviors, but whether you were doing anything about them wasn't assessed. And we really don't have longitudinal follow-up. So where we are, practically, is that clinical experience is driving what we're doing rather than the data, which I think is very challenging. But I'm going to share my clinical experience and tell you what I recommend. So when would I recommend switching? When there's no response. Don't augment things that don't work. That makes no sense at all. It's like multiplying by zero. When the medicine is very poorly tolerated, and if the patient doesn't have a severe illness, because when someone's really ill and you say, oh, this isn't working, let's switch, sometimes you are painfully made aware that it was doing something, and the patient has a crash in their mood, perhaps getting to a point of really dangerous symptoms. You want to think about that. And of course, we want to think about the patient preferences. Some people feel strongly about only being on one medicine. That might not be optimal, but if outpatients are going to decide what they're going to do. You're in a discussion with them, and I think we need to never lose sight of that. So when would I recommend augmenting? Well, if there's a partial response. That's where a partial response matters. I have a, a very scientific outpatient will say, we have a signal. And when he says we have a signal, I think, well, we're going to maximize that or we're going to do something else about it because that's what we're trying to do. If, it's being to if the medicine's actually tolerated, if you're going to augment for specific symptoms, like there's a strong family history of bipolar disorder and certainly nothing that would cause a bipolar diagnosis, but a hint of hypomania or cycling or cycling between depression and being euthymic, I think of lithium, as opposed to associated brief mixed states where I would think about a neuroleptic first. So, you know, the clinical, and then of course if there's side effects, I mean the most common example of someone having significant sexual side effects with an SSRI and then adding bupropion because there is data, good data, that that can be very effective in managing those side effects. And so the others are, as I said, patient preference. Just a moment about psychotherapy. If you look at multiple randomized trials, this meta-analysis looked at 16 different studies. When you compare medication alone to the combination of medication and psychotherapy, the combination almost always wins, which of course we know but I just felt the need to say that and add that. So going back to Sweden, and that really interesting, huge epidemiologic study, community study, they looked at healthcare resource utilization and lost workdays. It won't surprise you. What they did is pretty clever. So the index, you have treatment-resistant depression when it has been your third antidepressant. And because they have all these other cases, they were able to match and they matched on um, age, sex, number of previous depressive episodes, socioeconomic status. And so with that, they had these well-matched patients. And they said, well, look in the year before, time-wise, and the year after. So not surprising, those with treatment-resistant depression later had more visits, more hospitalization use, and more lost work days. But the lost work days are, were really striking to me. Even in the next year, there are people missing 130 days from work. And so I think the disability, even in those that perhaps don't need to be in the hospital or you're not worried about their immediate safety, there's enormous disability and financial burdens for patients associated with treatment-resistant depression. So let me say something about hospitalization. My most important point here is that admission criteria should not be certification criteria. I think too often if someone's not actively suicidal, we think there's not a role for them being in the hospital. Sometimes you're going to, of course, manage suicidal thoughts or plans. Sometimes you're going to titrate a dose in someone who's been unable to do that. Sometimes you're interrupting destructive behaviors that have really gotten out of control. 
I would not admit someone just to get their sleep back on schedule, but it's a benefit, perhaps with other things going on. And maybe you're going to initiate a course of ECT, or as we heard about this morning, a course of IV ketamine. So different things you might do in the hospital. And the reason to do it is that if you look, again, going back to this really nice study from Sweden, there's a four-fold increase in intentional self-harm for those who have treatment-resistant depression to those with major depression that's not treatment-resistant. So this is a group at very high risk of self-harm. So just wrapping up the treatment, I want to say something about ECT. We know it's the most effective treatment for treatment-resistant depression. That is re agreed upon in the literature without question. But there aren't too many systematic evaluations of this. And it does not have the response rate of 80 to 90% that we sometimes quote to patients. That is for individuals who have not had multiple failed treatments, or perhaps those presenting with very, a very severe drop-off. I wasn't that ill, and then suddenly I was having hallucinations and delusions, was intentionally suicidal, or I was catatonic. We know with those patients, when we recommend ECT, it's going to go well. That's the 80 to 90%. But 50 to 60%, as I talk with patients about on Meyer 4 when we're consenting them, that's still better than any next medication trial. And I think we too often make this the treatment of last resort because of patients' feelings about it and, and concerns. So it can work faster, that's one of its great benefits, but it, when that episode has gone on longer and longer, it's less likely to work. So having this conversation sooner or putting it into the treatment discussion sooner I think can be really important in the management of treatment of depression. I said I was going to talk about practical things, which is why I'm only going to really touch on these novel treatments or, or new treatments. Some are FDA approved, like the new TMS SAINT procedure. Others, like intranasal ketamine, we have available. Doctors Paul Kim and Paul Nestat run the S-ketamine clinic, and so that's an option here. Vagus nerve stimulation was very popular when I was a fellow, but not so much now. You can derive from that what you will. But then we have other things that are not FDA approved, but some have a breakthrough device designation, like for psilocybin and deep brain stimulation. Those, we need more information. We're now able to do IV ketamine on Meyer 4 and Meyer 6. So the reason I'm excited that we have these options is going back to the last thing the patient said beautifully. Like, you can't give up. You have to hold on to hope. And so when we feel like, okay, we've done enough of these traditional treatments, they are not helping this patient, it's great to have options. And practically, we have esketamine, we have ketamine, and I hope soon, Dr. Reddy, that we're going to have the same procedure. This is data from a study that Kevin Lee, Dr. Reddy, and Dr. Zandi did. Now, this is with bipolar one patients, but they had treatment-resistant depression. And so if you don't know, the SAINT procedure, this Stanford-developed treatment, they use fMRI to target where you're going to do the TMS, and then you get 10 brief theta burst stimuli, 10 in a day for five days, which could be an inpatient kind of protocol. It's not there yet, but I hope we'll get there soon. And I actually think these results show exactly what happens with these novel treatments. Some people do extremely well and some people don't get any benefit. But it's something to try. And this is something that you would expect to see a response fairly quickly, so more to come on that. I, I do want to temper my genuine enthusiasm for new things and having more options with a quote from Dr. Uh, Molly, who is one of the international leaders, he's an Australian psychiatrist, who was the leader in developing the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists guidelines. So in those practice guidelines for major depression, he has this quote, treatment-resistant depression is increasingly being used um, first to describe a subtype of depression for which there's no evidence and second, an indication for novel, untested treatment strategies. So I think he's asking us just to moderate our enthusiasm. So let me end with the practical strategies. Confirm the diagnosis. Well, first, it's take a history, but I'm going to bank on you to all do that. Confirm the diagnosis. Identify and treat comorbid conditions. Maximize the antidepressant dosage and, of course, assess adherence. <clears throat> 
If someone's not responding, think of switching or augmenting. Talk about side effects so you can manage those and hopefully increase adherence. Consider more intensive psychotherapy, because you should be doing psychotherapy. And then consider referral, whether that's for ECT or hospitalization, a specialty consultation, or one of the novel treatments. Now, when I say maximize, I didn't think I could do this grand rounds without showing this chart that the last 15 years of residence will recognize, in which I, and for the PGY2s, it's coming Wednesday, where I have starting doses, good doses, and maximum doses. And I only put this up because this is a huge issue, because so often treatment-resistant depression is really inadequately treated major depression. I want to reiterate that a lack of response does not negate the validity of the diagnosis because so few people have gotten adequate treatment. We jump to, they're not getting better, maybe they have something else. Like, well, let's look at the treatment they've gotten. And I've said this 15 times, but you really need to make sure that we have adequate treatment. You don't need the medicine in your stomach, you need it across the blood-brain barrier for it to do any good. And so you have to have an adequate dosage to do that. And so treatment, treatment based on the perspectives we hope is going to have medication and psychotherapy, treating comorbid conditions, and for some patients, treatments like ECT or some of the novel conditions. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Swartz. Really terrific talk, very valuable. Uh, great message at the end, uh, the one with the red ink, inadequately treated which makes me think maybe maybe uh, it'd be nice some faculty members might want to get a hold of that uh, table that you have <laughs> in addition to residents. I just gave it to Dr. Costelli. Okay, there you go. She looked at my that, slides just because she's table, my close friend. That table's something we should all have. That table's um, a useful well, Let me ask you this. In, in addition, how often do you think, um, how often do you think treatment-resistant depression is a function of the thing I think maybe you started with? This issue of inadequate management, that is inadequate amount of time by the psychiatrist, either in visits or inadequate frequency of visits or inadequate availability between visits. And in order to manage the patient as they're trying to decide whether to take the medicine or whether to keep taking it after the side effect starts. So if the question is how often is it that there's inadequate treatment, based on my 30 years experience in the console clinic, I think it's high. I think that you have, but I also think there are individual patients, you know, in Sweden they found it was about 11% where they have national health. Now a lot of that is primary care, but, you know, I do think there's a subset, but I don't think it has to be 30%. I mean, I think in the star D, they Wait, had the, a, the, the percent you're quoting is regard to the first point up here, or, or my question. Oh, I think that, I think that a huge percentage is inadequately treated. So if the star D says that People aren't getting enough into their system. Yeah, it's yeah. not getting into their system and they're not getting adequate treatment. And that's for a million, or they're trying to have treatment when they have their own management involves high dose alcohol or high, you know, some other substance that is going to interfere with treatment. So I think that is huge. I think engaging patients to really get comprehensive treatment is uh, challenging, especially when people feel awful. I mean, when people say I'm doing this, like, I understand why you're doing it. I'm not judging you. I'm saying what we're going to do together won't be successful unless you have some success in not doing that, which is a different thing. Thank you. Other folks have questions? Dr. Treisman. Uh, 
Dr. Treason and I completely agree that evaluation is another role you could use for hospitalization. We used to get, we get referrals to the affective consult clinic where we'll say this is too complicated for an afternoon. You know, we're really gonna need to see you over time. And the input of our colleagues, data from 24 seven evaluation often makes the difference. It, it allows you to really see things you were missing. So I completely agree that that should be considered as well. And I agree that it is, it is an increasingly harder thing to get payers to agree with. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Other folks have questions? Uh, Dr. Redgrave. Karen, thanks, that was great. I was mad at you taking notes, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering, I think I know the answer. Um, uh, any, any role yet, if ever, for So the question is about genetic testing, and we've had several excellent grand rounds about that. So when things aren't going, you know, sure, get some information. I think we just have to be realistic that genetic testing right now gives us information more about metabolism than it does about efficacy. And so I think we just have to be honest with patients. But maybe that's a piece of information that's helpful. We had a recent patient on the inpatient unit who needed the highest dose of nortriptyline I've ever seen to get an adequate dosage, which had us thinking perhaps he is a remarkably fast metabolizer, which changed your idea about the kind of doses he would need of subsequent antidepressants. So that can be helpful, but I think we just have to be honest with patients that it is not as it is sometimes portrayed. These are the medicines that work or don't work. Great, thanks, Dr. Taylor. So thinking about the right or wrong kind of psychotherapy, so for 30 plus years of doing residency interviews, I'm often asked, what kind of psychotherapy do you do? And I said, well, I do mood. So like seven kinds, because you do a very different kind when you're trying to decide if someone has to come into the hospital and then you're doing behavioral activation and then you might be doing CBT to challenge the cognitive distortions and then you might be doing more insight-oriented psychotherapy and then for those who grew up in chaos, once they're stable, you might be doing something where you're really focusing on family issues. And so I think with depression, with mood, which is obviously what I focus on, you have to be facile in switching the type of psychotherapy. And so when someone says, I do DBT and no matter what you're getting that, or I, but for example, DBT. People say, I don't wanna do DBT because I don't have borderline personality disorder. And I say, DBT helps you manage stressful emotions more productively and less destructively. Sounds pretty good for anyone with a severe mood disorder. So I think you have to match it to where the person is in their, uh, the severity of their symptoms. Dr. Gibson. You say, we know what's going on here. Well, I completely agree. Dr. Lipsy is making the point that there is actually an investment in a proper assessment that might lead to better outcomes, which I think we all agree upon. But that ha I think if that got studied in some way, public health colleagues figure out a way to study this, because if that got studied in some way, we could make the argument that, that what we're doing in the long run is gonna lead to less, uh, you know, lower cost. Thanks, I apologize. There are more questions. I encourage people to come down and speak to Dr. Swartz.
Uh, wonderful talk. Very, very helpful. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you.